welcome everyone. And thank you to Western Chapter for reaching out at the very least and trying to coordinate and get this together. Um, so as we mentioned in our prior call with most med students and residents and learners, our, we would like to do as much as we can based off what you guys wanna do. And so you guys brought up this idea of having a talk on advocacy and we felt, well, we're here, we can provide you some guidance, some advice and go from there. So CDM, as you guys are aware, we're, we're hoping to do this talk that is affiliated with the Western chapter, but we made it open to anyone else who so chooses wants to join based off our WhatsApp group. Next slide, please. So this is who we are. I think you guys have met me in passing, but Montana, that's, you know, yourself, Dr. Frazier's on as well. And then Katie and Zarif, who are both um, members of CDM. So what is CDM? I, I'm sure all of you are familiar. Founded by Daniel Martin in uh, 206, it's a, it's a nationwide evidence-based member organization that we hope to strengthen and preserve Canada's publicly funded healthcare system. And so at the last talk, we did discuss what the CANBE trial is. It is an ongoing trial that in September, the court had ruled in favor for public health based off the ruling, and it's currently still being appealed. But that's something that CDM's involved through being an intervener in the case. And then our big other piece that we've worked on with policy work is Pharmacare. We've worked with many other organizations regarding how to advocate towards the government with the government regarding universal Pharmacare. At our last retreat, we did adopt two other policies that we'd like to focus on, which is regarding elderly care, um, which aligns with CMA's agenda, as well as innovations in the public healthcare system. Great, and I think with that, we can go over to Montana. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think pretty much everyone here knows who I am, but um, for those in case there's a couple of people from another school, uh, my name is Montana. I am uh, currently a second year medical student at Schulich uh, and one of the chapter leads uh, for CDM Schulich. And it's really exciting um, to kind of host this session and also have um, quite a few people from the, the CDM board here to speak. Uh, I thought I'd kind of just touch on a couple things about our chapter just to give people a general idea of our process and, and where we currently are. Um, so we started quite recently, which um, I think most chapters across the country have. Um, you know, for those who are not, we do have a, a Facebook group set up for membership specific to our group, which is really great. Um, so we're excited to have a lot of engagement with um, that group of people, but also medical students at large. Um, we do have the pleasure of kind of interacting with some of the other CDM chapters around the country to try to plan some collaborative work, uh, which is great. And I know a number of people uh, are involved with the um, uh, Canadian Health Coalition's Lobby Day that CDM is, is participating in as well, which is fantastic. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about why we asked for this session. Um, you know, specific for me, uh, if you've ever interacted with me, I know um, that one of the things that I'm very passionate about is trying to figure out a way to improve uh, not only healthcare system, but our society at large. And I've kind of landed on, you know, political lobbying, healthcare lobbying, and advocacy as being the way to do that. And I know a lot of people in my class and otherwise um, appreciate that as well. And if this is something you're interested in, then definitely reach out to this group, definitely reach out to me and we can find ways to get you involved. Because I think it's something that our generation is particularly active and passionate about. And um, obviously, you know, with the stepping stones that past generations, current generation, Kind of laying out for us. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for our group to, to drive for some real change. So that's kind of what I wanted uh, when we asked for this session was to kind of see how some of the pros who are currently doing the advocacy, doing the groundwork and have been uh, for quite a while um, do it and pass on some you know fantastic knowledge and skills that we can all kind of take advantage of and um, utilize in our own work. I thought one other thing um, just quickly to pitch before we get going um, in addition to, to doing this, I'm also the, the CFMS Director of Government Affairs for the next year, which is very exciting. Uh, and we have a spring call for positions. And so if any of this interests you in terms of the political advocacy process and you're interested in getting more involved with the CFMS, then feel free to reach out to me and uh, I'll give you a rundown of all the opportunities that we have. But yeah, thanks so much uh, for everyone coming out and I'll, I'll pass it back to our, our CDM board members to run the session. So thank you so much. Great, Sarah, do you wanna make your presentation? All right, so my name is Sarah Fraser and I'm a recent addition to the Canadian Doctors for Medicare board. I joined 
last year in the fall. Um, and I'm a family doctor. I am in Nova Scotia. We were having a little bit of a chat before this conversation officially started, but the the pandemic is is finally uh, finally getting bad here on the on the east coast. Um, so we were rem uh, discussing the joys of, of lockdown life. I can now relate. Um, so family doctor, also a writer. Disclosures would be I'm the editorial fellow for a medical journal. So I, I edit scientific articles and write editorials for <clears throat> the journal Canadian Family Physician. And I'm the co-director of the Dalhousie uh, Medical Humanities Program here uh, in Nova Scotia. Did my med school at Dal, uh, did my residency at Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Um, before medicine, I studied ornithology. That's a fun fact about me. I was uh, into um, conservation of a, a very strange bird called the loggerhead shrike, which I know way too much information about. Um, and I feel like in the last year, I've had another residency in pandemic medicine, um, given the situation we're in. Uh, and March 11th of last year, I don't think any of us would have thought a year later that we would still be in this situation, um, still, uh, still in lockdown in the middle of the third wave. I certainly did not think that this would still be the case. Um, and I can't imagine what it must be like to go through medical training during a pandemic. So my hat's off to you folks out there. Um, and as a healthcare industry, and I use the term industry on purpose because it, it is an industry, um, but part of that industry um, is us. And uh, especially now in the pandemic, it, it's our time to shine, right? Where we can put our our medical skills to use, but I think there's a lot of different ways to shine. So um, family doctor, mostly I work as a hospitalist um, and I got into medicine probably for the same reason that a lot of you got into medicine, um, feeling that you want to help people. Oh yeah, and it was the Harper government at the time and there were complete cuts to the environmental sector. So I couldn't find a job in environmental sciences as well. Um, so, but also, uh, it, I always wanted to be a doctor in, um, during my undergrad, but really loved loved the outdoors and loved the environment too. So, um, but I, I'm glad I did get into medical school. Um, and yeah, I got in because I, I ended up working for a research company before med school, would write reports for this um, research firm that was doing government program evaluation and it was not exactly uh, riveting. Um, felt like, I wasn't really uh, making a difference in the day-to-day, -day, writing a report that would just kind of sit on a shelf for a very long time and, and perhaps uh, not many people would read it. Um, and, and so in medicine, I felt like this is such a tangible, tangible way where you can really make a difference and heal people and treat them. And I finished residency five years ago and I feel that um, is true. So first year after family medicine, uh, family medicine residency, I, I did a million things. I did a million jobs. I worked nonstop, just wanting to get so much experience right off the bat, um, learned a lot, but also felt really exhausted at the end of the year, verging on burnout actually. And part of that was um, seeing a lot of frustrations in the system. And I don't think you really realize like, how much impact that can have on you is, you know, not only are you seeing people suffering um, and you're working really hard, but um, just the systemic frustrations that you see day to day. Um, for example, um, I had a patient with opioid use disorder who was do doing really well on opioid replacement therapy. And she had just gotten a job at a supermarket but then uh, she was told if she took that job, her income would be too high. So she wouldn't be able to, to um, afford her hepatitis C treatment. So she ended up not taking the job as she was waiting to get the treatment. And uh, she ended up rel relapsing shortly there after as well. And it's just, you see these things and it just, it's so frustrating. It makes no sense. Um, Another patient, um, nice seven-year-old woman, this is just an example, um, making up, but uh, un unable to afford um, home care and is admitted to a long-term 
care facility last year becomes ill with COVID-19 and loses her life in the context of all of the visitor restrictions. It's there, there's so much, so much sadness out there. And and especially this the suffering that's preventable. Um, I realized that when um, doing work with advocacy and getting getting into advocacy more in the last few years, it's almost like a um, a way to prevent burnout. And you think, well, it's all this extra work, and often it's unpaid work. How can that prevent burnout? But I think it's actually really rewarding to do what you think is right to not only advocate for patients on an individual level, but um, on, a, on a broader level. Um, when I, I really like writing, that's kind of my venue. That's always been my venue for advocacy. And if I see something in the media I don't agree with, or if there's something I feel passionate about, I'll write an opinion piece about it. Um, or I've written a book of uh, poetry about, about medical experiences um, or blogging or even just a tweeting or anything social media I, I that's my my form of advocacy and when I was a first year medical student one of my mentors um, I shared a poem with him and he said that he thought I could change the world more with writing than I could with medicine and as a first year medical student who just tried to get into med medical school got in my second time and I thought that that was the answer for uh, you know being able to make a difference and and it, it is, it can be, but but also I understand more what he meant now that you you can have um, an even broader um, an even broader impact um, by by getting involved in advocacy. Um, I wanted to give an example of uh, an advocate uh, from the Toronto area, and you might know her, Dr. Uh, Nashwa Ahmed. So she was the trauma surgeon who was on call the night of the Danforth shooting. And that really, that event um, stuck with her so much. And as a result of, of that, she started an organization, Canadian Doctors for Protection Against Guns. And um, she received a lot of backlash. So with advocacy, it's, it's not, um, always going to be pleasant. So she received, I think, over 30 complaints to the college. Um, and these were all pro-gun uh, groups. Um, and they were all, of course, dismissed. But sometimes it involves um, putting yourself in, an, in a potentially vulnerable or uncomfortable uh, position. Like I wrote a, an opinion piece recently um, and it was in line with the types of things that public health is recommending. And, um, and then uh, uh, someone kind of attacked me for it. And, and you know, it's, it can become a battle war sometimes in the media and said, my, my claims are unfounded, blah, blah, blah. Even yesterday, my Facebook account was shut down because um, someone complained, someone complained about it because I was, <laughs> spreading misinformation but it was you know along the lines of stay at home and wear a mask so um yeah there there can be uh, it can be a vulnerable place to be um but i think it's also uh, very rewarding um so getting involved in canadian doctors for medicare has been great again i'm a new member but um so far just getting to know the other members and doing things like giving talks like this one um and and the two the two things that we focus on are um, are pharmacare and also preventing the privatization of medicine in Canada. So anyway, that's just a brief overview of of uh, how I see advocacy and and fit it into my life. And I will pass it back to you. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, so. For the next uh, little bit, um, uh, myself and then uh, Zarif, who's our uh, membership and uh, community engagement coordinator, will talk a little bit about building a campaign um, and identifying issues, um, uh, as well as some tactics um, for um, building for change. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. 
Um, and sort of bouncing off some of the ideas um, that Sarah was uh, mentioning, um, often there's sort of the question of why be an advocate or also uh, what can we uh, achieve? Um, and many of us uh, become advocates, whether it's in health advocacy or more broadly, um, because we care at the core of it um, and we identify um, systemic shortcomings that we really feel um, should be changed. And so we come together to uh, push for policy and legislative changes. Um, and at the bottom of that slide, there's just some examples. Um, our former chair, Daniel Raza, um, at a Patients First uh, presentation, uh, board member Vanessa Bursick uh, at a rally for refugee health. And then um, on the right um, is uh, former board member Bob Willard outside the courts um, in the Canby case. Um, and so a lot of the time advocacy is about raising awareness about those uh, struggles and shortcomings that we see to help empower others to want to join us and make change. Um, and another thing that's really important is creating a path for more change down the line and supporting others to come join us. And that's partly why we're so excited by some of the organizing happening across the country in these chapters. And we really wanna support you in um, building your own um, campaigns and projects and identifying the changes that you wanna bring about. And while you know, at our core of our mandate is to uh, defend and protect Medicare, we also you know, work together to re-envision and be optimistic. So where can we get in the future? Um, in, you know, we currently work very hard on pharmacare, but thinking ahead, you know, can we achieve universal single payer dental care? Can we bring mental health care or other care um, into the basket of services that's covered under Medicare that um, aren't currently? And so if you've identified an issue that you want to start uh, building a campaign around, um, uh, I think that you really need to be uh, strategic about how you wanna bring about change. And that involves identifying your audience. And so to do that, I think you need to think through um, what the real goal is around the issue. Do you need to raise awareness and build support? Or is there a really specific tangible policy change or legislative change that you wanna bring about? And that'll really help you identify who you need to be communicating with or um, what your campaign should look like. So if it's about raising awareness or support, that might be the general public, it might be the medical community, um, your colleagues and fellow trainees. If there's a specific change, it might be governing bodies, governments and uh, individual politicians. So whether that's at the Medical Association, uh, Canadian or your PTMA, or a body like the CFMS or even the Royal College. And then if it's legislative, you need to understand whether it's the municipal, uh, provincial or federal government that actually has the power to make that change. And sometimes there will be multiple bodies that you need to be working at, working with. And of course, on a bigger issue like something like pharmacare, it's both. So for instance, for many years, um, it didn't seem achievable to many people that we could have pharmacare um, included under Medicare. And so a lot of the work for many years in campaigning was around raising awareness about the issue and building public support. Um, and now we find ourselves where, you know, 90% of Canadians are supportive of pharmacare and we really need to be pushing at the um, legislative levels of the federal government, but also to get buy-in from the provinces. But you kind of have that cycle of always also needing to um, be doing some of the general public communications and engagement. Then I'll hand it over to Zarif to talk a little bit, once you've identified your audience and the issues, um, how to start thinking about uh, building a campaign. Perfect, uh, thank you so much. Hi folks, my name is Zarif, uh, pronouns are he and him. I also uh, did my master's at Schulich, but it was the business school <laughs> and not uh, medical school. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I haven't really prepared a script or anything for this because I am also an organizer in both um, labor spaces and even for um, tenant unions um, across uh, the greater Toronto area. So I think it, it should come to me a, a little naturally by now um, or else have I been doing good work. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, building a campaign, I think this is really important in terms of, you know, um, 
setting goals and objectives. And, you know, as an organizer, I've been taught to, you know, focus on organizing and not just mobilizing. And there is sometimes a difference between organizing and mobilizing. And um, one example would be mobilizing would, let's say, be just hosting one maybe phone zap um, or maybe one action at your campus. And, you know, you built awareness for that day. And after that, the momentum sort of just goes off and you mobilize for that one day. Um, so it's really important to have a strategic plan um, to your campaign and actually build out a campaign where you're, you know, mobilizing um, according, you know, to that plan. And you sort of start with, you know, um, as uh, Katie sort of took us through um, identifying the audience, um, you have to sort of um, really understand the root of the problem. And sometimes that is set through by understanding the audience. And um, more specifically, uh, it sometimes does range around um, power mapping. And you sort of power map to understand, you know, where are the levels of power at, where are they concentrated, and how can you target those levels of power to make a difference ultimately. Um, so it does come back to, you know, setting your objectives, making a firm set of demands, and making sure you can sort of move ahead with those demands and what the outcomes and wins look like um, and what are alternatives that are acceptable. For example, um, the status for all campaign that was happening for, you know, migrant workers, migrant farmers, um, international students who were here, you know, they set the demand of the overarching demand of, you know, status for all. They also had a lot of um, other demands that sort of go with it. Um, and even though, you know, sometimes all those demands are not met, they had other alternatives, which, you know, could be sort of categorized as wins to help um, sort of move their um, uh, campaign or movement forward. And, um, and those um, evaluations are based on the conditions sometimes changing or, you know, more public awareness. Um, um, and, you know, it sort of goes along those sort of lines. And then, yeah, it, it's important to sort of, you know, come up with key statements, uh, messages, facts, and evidence. For example, um, for paid sick days, you know, we saw a lot of campaigning happening um, by the Decent Health and Work Network, by 15 in Fairness. And they had a lot of statements on um, why we needed facts and evidence to show the direct results of um, not getting paid sick days. And they had key messages from doctors, nurses, um, workers um, in precarious positions or in the front lines. And that sort of helped them build a campaign. And um, so it's really important to sort of, you know, be strategic with your campaign and then mobilize accordingly with, um, with, uh, with those campaign objectives, like the paid sick days. There was a car caravan around um, uh, Queen's Park, which is the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, um, which was followed by dropping off 30,000 petitions for um, the MPs and um, uh, provincial sort of representatives. And, um, you know, so that, so it wasn't just doing a petition or just um, uh, mobilizing for one day, it was, there was a line of events which sort of helped them build their campaign from a grassroots level. And um, it helps people, and with those um, pieces, sort of people sort of get more of an idea of, you know, the overall picture. Um, and in terms of like, you know, uh, bringing workers to the forefront, bringing nurses, um, doctors, in a way they sort of brought in all the people who were impacted and create coalitions and relationships. Um, and that sort of goes back to the last point here in terms of who are your allies, for example, um, Decent Work and Health Network work, work with um, 15 Fairness, they work with Jane and Finch, Action Against Poverty. Um, they work with a lot of groups to sort of, um, you know, really build that campaign. Um, for example, like there's doctors for LTC justice here, and you sort of want to partner with those organizations who have already been doing great work, building power, and see how you can amplify each other, um, which does set you up for uh, a better route as opposed to sort of, you know, tackling it on your own and kind of being siloed away from other movements who have been taking on the work and doing the great work. If you want to go to the next slide, Katie. Thank you. Um, so yeah, in terms of a little bit of the diversity of tactics, um, like we saw with, uh, or as I was mentioning with um, paid sick days, we had rallies, phones, apps, community meetings um, every two to three weeks. Um, uh, Carolina, uh, Carolina, who's the um, 
uh, coordinator for Decent Work and Health Network. She was giving press conferences quite often, um, you know, dropped off those petitions um, in front of the assembly, as I was sort of mentioning. And they were also complemented with so many op-eds. Um, uh, Danielle Raza, who's the uh, past chair for, you know, Canadian Doctors for Medicare, um, he wrote um, op-eds uh, or Twitter threads and lost count, but I've seen almost every doctor sort of make a point on the importance of paid sick days and the impact, the direct impact they saw uh, on their patients. Um, and that was also sort of followed up with, you know, social media campaigns, digital organizing. Um, I believe all the meetings because of COVID did, was, did happen um, over the internet or over Zoom. And, um, you know, uh, for example, Dr. Daniel Raza, he sort of, you know, sent a little um, video clip to Decent Work and Health Network. Um, uh, a lot of doctors did, and that's sort of, you know, all added together to build a strong campaign. And that's kind of the main thrust of um, what we're sort of trying to go at. And in the future, you know, if you're interested, um, I think we can have um, just one day workshops and what, what does power mapping look like, or one day workshops on, you know, once you've organized how to mobilize or, you know, um, setting objectives, targets, and it can be done with um, groups who have been, you know, movement building from the grassroots level, like decent work and health network or health providers against poverty. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of how we move forward. Thank you, <laughs> Sarah or Dr. Fraser. Um, and yeah, um, that does, you know, get, a, get at the gist of sort of um, what I did want to cover. But if you have any further questions, um, please feel free to reach out. If you even want to sort of, you know, um, want to know what's happening in Toronto at the grassroots level with tenants and labor spaces, always happy to talk about those matters as well um, and see what we can sort of learn from each other and, you know, collectively build our movements. Um, I'm, I'm good here, Katie, thank you. Great, thanks, Sarif. And similar to how we had that sort of arrow pointing, you know, from the sort of awareness and public support versus legislative, um, the, the cycle here in the, in the tactics doesn't need to be uh, one way. Um, that was just sort of the default <laughs> for this graphic. Um, but, you know, as you identify um, both the opportunities for bringing about change and being strategic, as well as your audiences, uh, you may want to have like a few from kind of each area. Um, you may find that doing a direct action um, leads to getting some earned media um, or um, having a social media campaign can really support um, uh, awareness around your direct action. Um, and all of that can be building momentum around um, the really strategic sort of um, uh, lobbying or government relations you might be doing on a topic. And just to kind of bring this into like a little bit more tangible, we just, before we open it up to kind of a discussion, um, uh, as Zarif uh, mentioned, uh, any of these uh, tactics or tools could easily be something that we could host an event, uh, a workshop training on. So whether um, it's building a social media campaign or writing op-eds or how to lobby, um, those are all, you know, really um, important tools. And we didn't think we could do them justice um, by just trying to, you know, giving you the, the top two things to do on each of those. Um, but as we hear from the participants about which uh, specific areas they're interested in learning, uh, we can definitely think about organizing sort of follow up deeper dives. Um, so just a couple examples, um, sort of CDM related and uh, adjacent um, in terms of um, lobbying, um, even in the COVID times, we were part of the Healthcare for All National Coalition. Um, I was uh, supporting a lot of the communications around that campaign, and that was an open letter um, that received uh, hundreds of organizational uh, signatories um, sending messages um, to the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. Um, and then on the right, um, in a past winter, we have our uh, past chair, um, Dr. Monica Dutt, who was delivering um, thousands of petitions to the uh, health, the Standing Committee on Health um, at uh, the Parliament of Canada. Um, and uh, CDM was actually then quoted um, in their final report, as well as subsequent reports. 
um, keeping with examples of uh, government relations, our now chair, uh, Dr. Melanie Richard, presented to the Standing Committee on Finance. Uh, again, CDM uh, was cited in their final report. Um, Dr. Raza at a press conference for paid sick days. Um, and then on the bottom left, uh, Monica Dutch at the Ottawa Press Gallery uh, at a press conference for PharmaCare. And then, you know, on the one side, you've got your um, lobbying and your very official uh, avenues, but then there's always the great fun of direct action. Uh, so there was a really large uh, demonstration at Queen's Park um, in April 2019. I can't help myself, but the then tiniest CDM activist um, on the right is uh, my daughter, who was just about a month old at the time. Um, and then on the bottom, we've got another direct action outside the Queen's Park subway station um, done by uh, the Decent Work and Health Network. Um, and then we also touched upon the um, opportunities to, to host community events or, or opportunities to bring others into uh, campaigns. So um, in 2018, I believe, um, Bernie Sanders came to Canada. Um, it was an event hosted at Convocation Hall. Uh, tickets were free, but they crashed the site within like 20 seconds. And um, it was the, the hottest ticket in town. Um, we were fortunate enough to get to attend. Um, and uh, the top left, you see uh, past chair Daniel Raza doing some media. Um, uh, I think one of his greatest claims to fame, though we think that he has a lot of other things to be proud of, um, is that he got to meet Bernie. Um, but because we knew there was so much interest um, in Medicare for All, um, and actually how some of the things that are being talked about in Medicare for All go beyond our public health care system right now, uh, we hosted a live stream at the Gladstone Hotel. Um, and as soon as the event was over, we all uh, ran over to take questions and talk to people about um, you know, Canadian Doctors Medicare, the uh, Ontario Health Coalition was there as well, um, but to talk about um, how to, to think about better for Medicare. Um, we've also talked about social media organizing. Video can be a really, really powerful tool. Um, so uh, through uh, the Medicare for All campaign, as well as just um, videos independently produced by CDM, um, and as, as Reef was mentioning, a lot of people have been doing these like really great sort of selfie short videos that can be shared. Um, and then you, you know, you've got the healthcare workers fight back coming on and, and everyone can easily um, with, uh, with just their cell phone um, take action. Of course, my professional uh, videography uh, partner would be <laughs> disappointed with me uh, championing these tools, but it's really important to, to, to use all the tools in your tool basket. Um, Zarif mentioned a phones app, and in case uh, anyone hasn't heard of one, this is just an example, a screen capture. Um, actually, our, uh, our law firm, Goldblatt Partners, and our allies, um, they hosted a phone zap uh, for paid sick days. So here, the, uh, a lot of them are on Zoom, taking the time uh, to be together um, as they each individually call some MPPs um, demanding paid sick days. So another uh, fairly easy um, tactic to be done. And in terms of direct action, um, CDM ourselves have done a, a less direct action just within sort of our um, voice and mandate, but many of our allies have done a lot of really powerful ones. So um, Decent Work and Health and 15 and Fairness and the Workers Action Center um, did a die-in earlier for paid sick days. Um, and a lot of their um, events have uh, gotten tremendous, both social media and earned media um, attention.